Good afternoon, everyone. As you heard yesterday at the Police Foundation's annual State of the NYPD breakfast, we've identified half a dozen commands that at the end of 2018 had a violent crime rate more than twice as high as the rest of the city. And I spoke about our moral obligation to face that challenge head on. The precincts are the 4-0, the 4-1, and the 4-2 in the Bronx, the 7-3 and the 7-5 in Brooklyn, and the 2-5 in East Harlem where early in my career I was, I was the CEO there for two years from 2000 to 2002. So the way we calculated it was the violent crime rate is the combination of murders, rapes, robberies, and felony assaults adjusted for population in each precinct. These precincts don't necessarily have the highest gross numbers of individual crimes, but they do have the highest rates relative to their populations. I'll reiterate that even these six commands have seen huge drops in violent crime since the uh, early 1990s. And it's our shared success of the past that got us here today, a time and place where we can truly say we are the safest large city in America. And it's a never-ending mission to improve on that that caused me and, quite frankly, our entire leadership team to believe that we can continue to achieve uh, even more. Everyone who lives and works and travels around New York City deserves to live always in safety and to be free from fear. So for 2019, I'm framing one challenge for our police department and the whole city of New York. Beginning in February, I'll be convening a series of meetings in these six precincts with a wide range of community representatives. We'll talk through the problems, the concerns, and the challenges in each neighborhood. Elected officials from the local, state, and federal levels will be invited. Community leaders, young people, business folks, the clergy, uh, reps from our partner city agencies, and more, a cross-section of each neighborhood and I'll be bringing in relevant NYPD members, probably the precinct commander and the borough commander, along with Chief Hoffman. Uh, and Chief Hoffman will have a prominent role in this process. We're gonna start in Brownsville, in Brooklyn, and our goal is to hold each of these neighborhood meetings by late March, early April. What I envision is a kind of reset of our important work in these communities. And we all know we have a highly effective crime-fighting model in place citywide, and how can we make it work better, even better for everyone? These meetings will empower us together to find new solutions to tough problems. We'll do that through frank discussions, meticulous planning, coordinated action, and relentless follow-up. And we will know our efforts are successful when participation from all sectors of government and community is commonplace. Crime and disorder continues to be reduced, and quality of life in every block and every neighborhood is improved and most importantly sustained. Over the last five years, our initiatives, our initiatives have had positive effects but we need to go further into the six commands that I've mentioned. And make no mistake about it, there are other precincts too where the crime rate isn't quite double the citywide rate, and they're of grave concern to us also. The 4-4, the 4-6, and the 4-8 in the Bronx, the 6-7, the 7-9, and the 8-1 in Brooklyn. The first six precincts, though, will be our departure, that will be the departure point for us. We're starting here, but we won't be stopping here, and we won't rest until every block and every neighborhood enjoys the same level of safety and well-being as the rest of the city. And that's our pledge, to ensure that all neighborhoods are safe, regardless of where the people we serve call home. And now we're ha happy to take questions uh, you might have about this new effort. Ashley. So we have uh, the first meeting set up in the seventh three already. Uh, the invitations went out. I'm not going to go specifically as to who we invited, but as I said, it'll be elected officials community leaders, some young people. I don't want that to be, I don't want it to be 100 people, I want it to be 20 or so people so we can actually have a uh, meaningful conversation about a, what our strategy is moving forward in each one of these precincts. Yeah, um, right there. What do you hope will be different coming out of these meetings and what's already been happening? Yeah. Because haven't you already been collaborating? Yeah, yeah we have, but I, I, I consider this a, uh, an iteration of a neighborhood policing. You know, the police officers have that relationship there now, they're building those relationships. But in these six precincts and the other few that I, uh, that I mentioned as we go forward, I think, you know, having double the crime rate than the citywide average, I think it's critical that we do even more and we make sure everybody's included. Right? It's, not just, it's not just an NYPD issue, it's not just a police issue, it's a community issue. So we have to make sure we do our best uh, to bring, the, bring those violent crime rates down. Tom. Uh, uh, just are you envisioning bringing in more cops to these precincts? Like, how do you want to combat the crime problem? Yeah, it's, uh, if, if need be, 
you know, uh, we'll look at each precinct as we go through that. Uh, Chief Monahan, uh, Chief Shea, and Chief Pollock. Every Thursday morning, we, we will continue to still have our uh, very important CompStat meetings. But uh, we'll see. You know, we'll see what the nature of the issues are as we dig deeper into this. Yeah. What kind of city agencies are you looking to collaborate with? Uh, you know, I'm looking uh, looking for everybody. Quite frankly, you know, we're looking for uh, Department of Education, uh, NYCHA. You know, whatever that community, whoever serves that community, we're looking them to bring them into this conversation. Dean. Will you be at the meetings or your chief of department, chief of patrol? And secondly, you often say you know the crime issues in the city. Are you looking for people in the community to have to come up with innovative ways to tackle crime? Yes. You know, sometimes it's not just about enforcement. You know, it's maybe it's about working, doing community programs with younger people, keeping people away from crime. So this is going to be a, a holistic effort. Uh, to, to push those numbers down. That's, you know, even in it, it, it's the seven three, I think it's 14 per 100,000. You know, and the citywide murder rate is 3.4 per 100,000. You know, well below many other major cities in, in, uh, in the United States, but I think, uh, I don't think, I know we have to do more. And is that, yeah. can I go back? Uh, we'll, sure. We'll say, because I know the NCO meeting is usually the NCO and not the NCO. Yeah, this is, this is uh, the stakeholders. And then this, you know, as we move forward, because it's not just going to be one meeting. It's going to be a series of meetings, and I'm going to I'm going to meet with the police officers too, to make sure that they have everything they need uh, to make sure that we can then uh, keep crime down. Tony. Some of those precincts, I think Four Oz, Four Two, and South Bronx, uh, you already have pretty intensified anti-gang efforts and targeted policing. Uh, has that effort so far not been enough, or you have to intensify that? Yeah, I, you know, I, as we move forward here, I, I don't I don't know. I, you know, you look at the four O. I think there's a lot more we can do. Um, and the 7-3, they had 43 shootings last year. I, I, I don't know if you know off the top of your head how many the 4-0 had. They probably had in the 30s. Yeah, there, there's, there's more work that we can do there. And again, it's not just, you know, it's not just uh, the NYPD looking at it now. It's not that just the NYPD, the DA's office, law enforcement. It's got to be city agencies. It's got to be elected officials. They have to be involved in this. There's a lot at stake. John. A few years ago, you guys wrote a book um, about uh, violent offenders that you were targeting specifically, and since they were committing the, uh, the majority of the violence, parolees and things like that. Do you still feel like the case where you have like uh, uh, you know, violent offenders committing a bulk of the crimes? Like yeah, I think it's uh, again, you know, I've said it a zillion times. It's it's a very small percentage of the population that commit uh, the vast percent of violent crime in New York City. Shall yeah. we go off topic? Uh, yeah, hold on. Come on, let's your crush. Well, I just want to ask you a question about how are you measuring whether the meetings are effective and if they're making a difference uh, in terms of crime? Uh, I mean, that's an easy measurement. Is are the, are the is the violence going down? Are the, the murders going down? Are the shootings going down? Are the index crimes going down? I mean, how do you how do you assess whether these meetings are having that impact or if that impact is coming from somewhere else? Um, I mean, this is, this is part of the process. So we've been doing what we've been doing for a very long time now, for 25 years. And to push those numbers down even more, we have to make sure that everybody has a sense of ownership here, not just the people that live in the community, not just the police department, not just the DA's office, all the electeds, all the other city agencies, they have to take ownership of this issue also. Uh, during the speech yesterday, the unscripted edition uh, mentioning the shutdown, what prompted you to, to mention that? Well, th that's why Bill probably wouldn't want me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. That's why he didn't attend uh, the breakfast yesterday. He didn't think it was appropriate to, to attend a breakfast while his, uh, the people that work for him each and every day are having a difficult time uh, paying their bills, uh, tuition, food bills, whatever credit card bills, whatever issues that they have. I think that uh, a lot of great work has been done in New York City. And it's, again, not just the NYPD, it's, it's all of our law enforcement partners, especially so many of the federal agencies. And to have them uh, have to, to think about, other than, than, than what their, their mission is, what their, uh, their, their purpose is here, I think is, is unconscionable. I think uh, as we move forward, um, uh, this, this has to be resolved. Uh, I've never, never met a finer group of people that we get to work with each and every day and uh, have them treated like this. It's just not right. People in Washington have to come to their senses. Are there, are there concrete ways where this is affecting uh, public safety in the city? 
Uh, not at this point. I think we're too, too early on. But as, this, as each day moves on, uh, we're probably going to see more and more challenges. Tony? Yeah, I've got to follow up on the previous question. I mean, are, are there any cases, counter terrorism cases now, that are being impacted in any way by the slowdown? Not, 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 not as we see it. Not, not just yet. Yep. Um, we're hearing that there was a third person who's dead from the hammer attack. Um, can you provide an update on that and where the suspect is currently? All right, so I guess we're moving to off topic here. All right. Oh, well, I, 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 I sense that. I sense that. I sense that. <laughs> I sense that. Yeah, Dermot, want to talk about that? Thank you. Yeah, tragically, uh, earlier today we did receive notification that that now is a triple homicide uh, with the third victim passing away. So our thoughts go out to the family for that. Uh, the, the individual uh, remains in, a, in custody and he's currently in a hospital, undisclosed. Have you seen a psychiatric center at that hospital? I can't comment on that. Tom? Uh, uh, yesterday there was a, a big report about uh, the gun licensing division and uh, favoritism that was being made. Mm -hmm. um, can you unequivocally say that no favors are being given uh, out in the gun licensing division in light of the report that was just All right, so let me I'll just make a few additional comments and then I'll answer your question directly. Listen, these, these claims are being made by an ex-cop after his arrest on corruption charges and his credibility is highly suspect. These claims were investigated thoroughly by our IAB, Internal Affairs, the FBI's Public Corruption Unit, and overseen by federal prosecutors. Uh, these investigations found no credible basis to charge any other individual. So what we've done since then, the NYPD has implemented a number of reforms in the NYPD licensing division, a new management team, new CO, new XO, a new director. We implemented a new computer system that enhances the integrity of the applications established a more comprehensive background check, reorganized personnel to provide for increased levels of supervision and accountability, and uh, we established a firearms recovery unit to retrieve guns from licensees whose licenses have been suspended, revoked, or canceled. So that being said, are you confident? Yeah, I, am, I have complete confidence in the current leadership down in the pistol licensing division. So you don't believe that any of those favors are happening anymore? If they were? You want me to say it again? Yeah, okay. And then this last question on this, and uh, uh, real quick, is, um, is there anything in place like uh, for someone to, like, uh, an, a cop to opt out, opt out if, like, the person they're working to license for is, like, a relative or uh, someone he knows or something like that, like, a way to recuse himself from doing the, you know, from doing the process? Yeah, I don't know if that's part of the process. And It's Ann Prunty, uh, acting DCLM. So under our new in the license division, we have uh, applications are submitted online. Mm -hmm. And um, once they're submitted online, every step of the application process is reflected in that database. And no one person is responsible for reviewing the application, doing the investigation, and approving the license. In fact, those steps go to different uh, supervisors in the license division. And ultimately, the commanding officer has to sign off on every single license that's issued. So in terms of you know your concern about someone having a relative or a friend, I mean, common sense would dictate that they not handle that. But more importantly, they can't approve that license. It's got to go through these various steps. It's all recorded in the online system, and all of that is subject to audit. Uh, Deputy Commissioner John Miller, we Yeah, sure, John. Yep. I didn't get all that. Was there a question that happened? Uh, yes, there was. Yeah. Okay. Wait, where do you get up here? <laughs> you were you were also mentioned in some of these allegations that you uh, approved of these sort of shady um, gun licenses. So to reiterate what the commissioner said. You have a convicted felon who's admitted to taking a thousand dollars and conspiring with others uh, to continue a series of payoffs who is submitted a document where he's trying to stay out of jail and basically opened the phone book and thrown out every name he could think of after reviewing that yesterday uh, he refers to a meeting uh, which never occurred um, which I didn't attend because it never happened and then he makes the connective argument that a series of licenses were issued to powerful people following that meeting and this tacit approval. 
Um, and everybody he refers to there, and I can't get into individual names because we don't disclose licensees publicly, but everyone he refers to there um, has had their pistol licenses for between 10, 25, and 40 years. So I think there's um, a lot more fluff in that document than there is fact. Okay, so our, the gun laws that we have now in, uh, in New York City, as I think you all would agree, have helped us reduce gun crimes to, to the lowest level since the 1950s. Uh, we don't need any more guns on the street. There are seven ranges in New York City, so now if someone is traveling to one of those ranges, it's fairly easy for the police officer to know whether or not uh, that person is going to a range. Now if we open that up to, to ran other ranges, uh, outside the city or to second homes outside the city, uh, you're, you're putting more guns on the street. So uh, Mike Endall was uh, transferred out of the license division. Uh, he was uh, presented with charges. Those charges were adjudicated, and then he was then he retired. Is that a part? Is that a function of the agreement? Should have been held to account. Well, he was held to account. Uh, he was. There were internal charges preferred against uh, Inspector Endall. They were adjudicated before he was retired. He was penalized, and uh, and uh, he was he retired. Tony? Chief Shay, uh, the medical examiner came out with a ruling on the Boreas sisters for suicide. The Saudi sisters were found yep. for drowning. Uh, have you been able to amplify or come up with any uh, clarity on what compelled them to commit suicide during suicide? Well, I, I don't think the full, complete picture, Tony, will we'll ever truly know. What was in both of their minds at the time but as i said in an earlier briefing uh pretty exhaustive investigation uh manhattan south homicide excuse me manhattan north homicide local detectives and our partners um, everything that we had pointed to um, uh, a troubled girl uh, indications were there of uh, intent to commit suicide discussions were had when we traveled out of state as i said at the time and spoke to people out of state in law enforcement and uh, um, people where she was staying with, these things had come out and been surfaced. We also were able to add to that um, in Riverside Park, electronic devices were recovered uh, belonging to the two sisters. Uh, we were able to get into some, not all, uh, of those electronic devices, and then that further corroborated. So during the, this entire tragedy uh, that, that played out last year, uh, we never uncovered any indication of crime. Um, I think from the time of that earlier press conference. A few details gave us a little uh, additional clarity, but in terms of the why, I'm not sure we'll ever fully know the why. Hazel. Can you tell us anything more about the Uber driver that was attacked by the bike? Um, in, in Midtown South yesterday, we had an indication, an uh, Uber driver driving in Midtown, I think it was in the vicinity of about 40th Street and 5th Avenue, uh, roughly. We know that there was an altercation with uh, an individual that was riding a bike. Uh, the Uber driver was subsequently struck with the chain with that lock. Um, we put out a very good, I am very confident that we will make an arrest on this case. Uh, we put out that picture, it's widely circulated on social media. Uh, at this point in time, we're, we're, what we're getting is uh, it was unprovoked, although it could be unprovoked in the mind of one and it could be something where somebody was cut off. That's certainly something that we're looking at. So. Uh, looking for witnesses, reviewing the video in the area. Again, we have phenomenal picture of this individual. So in short time, uh, we will we will make an arrest. Uh, the Uber driver was treated and released for his injuries. But the driver said that it was unprovoked. That's what we're getting thus far. 
Yeah, we're working closely with the Brooklyn DA on that, and uh, that is the anticipated that the charges will be upgraded. Any yeah. Sorry. Um, do you have a comment on Justin Morrell's sentencing yesterday? There's a lot of comment that he got a really light sentence after he drank coffee. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we put, some, uh, put a statement out yesterday. You know, just uh, Dalsh, uh, quite frankly, his family, they'll never be the same. Uh, and to, to, to have this sentence imposed on this individual who committed such a uh, violent crime, I think is just, as I said yesterday, uh, yesterday was a bad day for justice for uh, NYPD, quite frankly, for New York City, and definitely for Dal Shreve and his family. Uh, Tony. Commissioner, you said at the end of your address yesterday, you made reference to uh, Subway Faraday, uh, which is a problem that Yeah, and we can we continue. Yeah, we continue to conduct fair, uh, fair evasion. Uh, most of that in the form of transit adjudication bureau summonses, uh, some arrests, and we're still uh, in conversation. I'll put it politely with the Manhattan DA's office uh, to uh, determine who constitutes who constitutes a uh, public safety threat. I think that's important. Uh, that some people need to go through the system. Some people uh, need to be arrested because this is this is habitual for them, and they do present a threat down in the subway. Yeah, right there. Oh, yep. the I'm council's ignoring you, Dean. <laughs> okay. The city council is going uh, debating a series of bills regarding transparency within the disciplinary process. The NYPD. I know there's a, a panel that's working as well. We expect. Yep. Uh, I'm sure you can say they expect those results to come out soon. Uh, where do uh, lead, where does leadership stand on this, and what do you think needs to be addressed within that realm? Yeah, so the uh, Blue Ribbon panel, uh, hopefully by the end of the week, I, I think it's uh, by the end of, by Friday, we should have that and it should be released publicly sometime next week. Uh, internally, we've been doing working groups. You know, we, we want to have more disclosure definitely than the past. We talk, I talk about trust and that's how we make the city safer and I think that would help us in that respect. But I still have concerns uh, for uh, the safety of police officers. Uh, we want to get to the point where we do maintain some sense of privacy but we also disclose uh, what the charges are, the police officer, and uh, the, uh, the disposition of the case. So I think we'll get there. So I don't think I took that piece of paper with me, but we do have uh, what IB looked at, the number of cases that we reviewed, the ones we deemed good, the ones we deemed put on hold, and the number of licenses that were revoked during this investigation. And I'll make sure we get that to you. And were any of the names in the memo mentioned of those that were not good? At, I, off the top of my, I don't think so, but uh, I gotta verify that, all right? Yep. And then uh, your chief of staff was Yeah, I did, and it never took place. I've known Ray Spinella for a long time. I can uh, attest to his character, and uh, I know that didn't happen. Let's do two more here. Yep, right here. What, the, what are you hearing? Uh, it's sort of the other side of the shutdown. What are you hearing as far as from your people um, about drugs and criminals coming through the southern border? And what is your position on the argument that a wall would stop crime, would lower crime, and how would that affect New York? Uh, um, so I, I, I've spoken at, not at length, but I have spoken about this in the past. You know, we don't conduct civil immigration enforcement and uh, undocumented uh, immigrants are not the uh, cause of crime in New York City. So that's where I stand. Yep. Uh, the mayor had a press conference an hour or so ago. I'll get you, relax, okay? <laughs> Sorry. Right. I see you over there. <laughs> it's your green shirt, man. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mayor had a press conference this morning discussing uh, bus lanes um, and uh, clearing those bus lanes, building more bus lanes. Some of the more 
highly publicized uh, cars that block those bus lanes often have NYPD placards on the dash. Uh, is there any effort within the department to uh, cut down on that kind of practice? Yeah, uh, a, uh, a memo went out to all the precinct commanders to make sure that we don't block bus lanes unless it's an emergency. Sometimes that's the only place you can be. Chief Chan from our Transportation Bureau, his personnel are, are making sure that doesn't happen too. So. And we, we need to do our best to clear bus lanes. And if, if we're part of that problem, we have to make sure it stops. Last call. You in a green shirt. All right, question for the green shirt. So in Brooklyn, there's some concern, and they're going to have a rally later. They said cops are overly aggressive with teenagers in the A1 precinct on a bus, threatening them with a taser, and aggressively forcing them off the bus. Do you know about the issue? Uh, I do. Yeah, but Chief Monahan is a little uh, more well versed in that. Third. Again, uh, Brooklyn North is doing the investigation over there. We have body camera video. Cops uh, brought them into the station house. Uh, there was a dis decision whether or not to arrest them. They were given cease summonses and released. The investigation is still ongoing to the actions, but as of now, we don't see uh, any, any reason to discipline the officers. Do you know what, what led to the cops being on the bus? We're well, still, still under the investigation. It's active right now. What, what exactly initiated it. But there's some body, co body one camera video that we're reviewing that kind of is telling. Great. Thank you, everybody.